church. I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 11 to 34, from the Christian Standard Bible. The title reads, Lydia's Conversion. From Traz we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrate, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our cities. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against him and the chief magistrate stripped them of their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they, f they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the prison and secured their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself, since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself, because we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in the house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, and he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Lebo. Uh, great, great reading. Thank you, Snaba, for hosting as well. Uh, thank you to our worship ministry for leading us in really beautiful, beautiful worship this morning. Open space to encounter God. I loved it. And thank you, Busi, uh, for serving us with a timely word through Selah. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are ready to hear from you as your word is open before us. We believe that your word is alive. We believe that you reveal yourself through your word. We believe that your word can transform us because your word doesn't only come into our ears and stays there. It goes into our hearts. It hits the soil of our souls. It pierces deep. And it leaves us edified, encouraged, inspired, and empowered. So Lord Jesus, I pray now as we open up your word, may we have that experience this morning. Thank you for the privilege of being in a place with brothers and sisters, with translations that we can understand, and with moments for us to expound the scripture. Thank you that we, that we get to learn together. I pray now that our eyes would be attentive, that our ears would be attentive, that our souls will be listening, and that our hearts will be open to you. I pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, fam, still in the book of Acts. Chapter 16 today, you saw that. We ended in Jerusalem last week. Do you guys remember? It was the Jerusalem Council. Lesechel did a good job in explaining what happened at that council. And as you guys know, the Jerusalem Council ended with great news. And what is the great news from the Jerusalem Council? Is the gate is open. You are saved by grace 
through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. That's enough. You don't have to uh, take on any culture. You don't have to take on any cultural practices. Jesus alone is enough. Let me say it like this, maybe shorthand in South African English. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. That's the point of Acts 15. And then we read in verse 30 of Acts 15, So they were sent off and went down to Antioch, and after gathering the assembly, they delivered the letter. Right. So from the council comes a letter, and the letter says what I just said. And then it says in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming the word of the Lord. Let me show you a map. I've got one on here for you. Uh, just to orientate us. So last week we ended here, Jerusalem, down in Israel in Judea. Paul and Barnabas went to Damascus and then they went to Antioch. Okay? And verse 35 just said to us, they stayed in Antioch for a while, reading the letter, rejoicing, equipping the saints. Okay, so this is where we are now. Through the course of our sermon, we will cross into Turkey, we will cross into Greece, and we'll stop in Greece, which is called on this map Macedonia today. Okay, so we have quite a long way to cover, but it's going to be awesome. Don't be discouraged. It's going to be great. I was hoping that you'll be able to read those small red blocks, but I realized that you, you can't. So that's fun. I also didn't memorize them, so I'll make it up as I go, which is also great. Okay, <clears throat> but that's where we are now, Antioch. Verse 36 of Acts 15 says, After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And then... Uh, the journey starts. Do you recognize some of the names up here? You'll see Derby, you'll see Lystra, you'll see Iconium, you'll see Pisidian Antioch. Okay, you guys remember? We have been here in the book of Acts. You also see Cyprus down here, which is where the first missionary journey started. So Paul and Barnabas, while they are in Antioch, say, hey, let's go and visit the brothers. Let's go. And let's see how they are doing. And then something happens between them. Barnabas says, awesome, let's take Mark. Paul says no. Barnabas says yes. Paul says no. Barnabas gives his reasons. Paul gives his. And then Paul and Barnabas split. It's a sad moment in the book of Acts. I mean, think about it, fam. These two gentlemen love each other. They have spent so much time together. The two of them are very unique and special gentlemen, uniquely gifted to further the story of the church in the New Testament. And they reach a point where they cannot agree about something. Now, I wish we knew what was Mark's issue, <laughs> because we don't. All we know is on the first missionary journey, Mark said, gents, I'm out, I want to go home. And then he just went home. And Barnabas says, let's give him another opportunity. And Paul says, no, there's no way that I'm going with him. It doesn't matter who you are. You might run into conflict with someone. And I want you guys to know that the Bible isn't a fairy tale. It's a real story. And this is life. Oh, I love peace. I love harmony. I love it. When, well, I love that harmony too, but I love harmony. You know what I mean? I love it when brothers are unified. If I was Luke... I would have gone, maybe I should just strike through this part of the story, you know, just gloss over it. But Luke didn't. And there's a split. Now, here's the amazing thing about their split. Jesus uses the split. Have you guys ever heard the promise in Romans 8.28? That God works together all things for the good of those who love Him? This is one of those examples. Why? Because now there are two teams on the ground. So even though they split, and Barnabas said, I'm going with Mark back to Cyprus, and Paul says, I'm going with Silas, and I'm going north, now all of a sudden we have two teams, gifted and on mission. It's crazy, huh? Now I want you to know that Paul eventually did reconcile with Mark. Yes, that's great news. In 2 Timothy 4, 11, 
Paul is very close to his death. He's really, really in a dark place. He's ran his race. He writes to Timothy. We'll get to meet Timothy now. And he says, only Luke is with me, the same Luke that writes Acts. And then he says, bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? So yes, there was a split. Yes, it was bad. Yes, there was a vibe between him and Mark. But in the end, as they grew together and as they were on mission together, they reconciled and Paul calls for him close to his death and goes, love Mark. The guy's a solid dude. Bring him, please. I would love to see him. Cool, huh? Then in 1541, it says, he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Paul went on to Derbe and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Okay, so follow the map with me. Through Syria, this is Syria over here. Through Cilicia, past Tarshish, where Paul comes from. Then they went on to Derbe. Then they went on to Lystra. And there they met Timothy. Now here's what I want you to see about Timothy. He's well known in two cities, Iconium and Lystra, far enough from one another that many people actually would not have ever traveled to the other one, remember? Because you travel by foot and you travel over the mountains. Timothy is such a solid dude that people there say, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. He's a really, really solid guy. And then it says in verse 4, this is of chapter 16. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, yes, and grew daily in numbers. The mission continues. I need you to see it. But look how far Paul has now traveled with this letter. Okay? So he's gone all the way up, spent time there, and now he is here at Lystra where he meets Timothy. And then it says in uh, um, 16 verse 6, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Okay, so look, this is Phrygia and this is Galatia. And they are on their way from Antioch in Pisidia. Do you guys think that they knew where they were going? They had no idea. But they obediently listened and prayed and discerned every single time. And look at what it says. The Holy Spirit had forbidden them to speak the word in Asia. Fam, look at Asia. Look at all these cities. Well-known big cities. Hierapolis, Colossae, Ephesus, Pergamum, Philadelphia, Sardis. Great places to go and minister. So many people, so many souls. It would have made sense if they were in Pisidian Antioch to go, let's just go west and hammer those cities. But the Spirit says, whoa, not going to do it. Then it says in verse 7, when they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, right? So they traveled around this region and they were like, well, if we're not going west, going back west, you guys feel me? We're not going west, we're going north into Bithynia, and then it says, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Trinity, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, he's going to say God in just a second. See the Trinity working there. And then it says, uh, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Look at this colossal roundabout way they're traveling, and they are missing all of these cities. Do you guys know how far that is? Do you know how treacherous that mountain range is? Just imagine, you've got three new people on your team, and they go, Paul, what on earth are we doing? And Paul goes, we keep walking, that's what we're doing. Because we couldn't go there, Spirit said no. Couldn't go there, the Spirit of Jesus said no. And in the end, they made it all the way here to Troas. And then verse 9 of chapter 16 says, During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him. Cross over to Macedonia and help us. A vision. Clear and compelling. We are here and there's a guy from that side shouting, Come over and help us. Verse 10. After he had seen the vision... We, we, it's been they until now. So who's with the party? Luke. So Luke joined in through us. 
we immediately made efforts out uh, to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, had called us to preach the gospel to them. Amazing start. The team is growing. We've got Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. I want you to see that God forbids and God permits. Did you know that? Sometimes we head into prayer as if God can never forbid anything. Well, then you haven't read the book of Acts. God, let's go west. No. Okay, let's go north. No. Okay, let's go southwest. No. I need you to head northwest. God forbids. God permits. It's part of the mission. I want you to see that verse 10 says they concluded. They thought about it. They weighed it up. It was in community. It's beautiful. Paul could have said, guys, I got a vision. Let's go. But Paul said, guys, I got a vision. Let's talk about it. Let's decide together. Let's draw up a game plan. Paul shares it with the others and they go. Where are we going? I've got no idea. But he's with us. Think about it. It wasn't Philippi in the beginning. It was just Macedonia. Let's go. And then it says in 1611, from Troas, so look uh, top left, uh, from Troas we put out to sea and sailed for Samoth, uh, Samothrace, it's a weird pronouncement in English, the next day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi. A Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia and we stayed in that city for several days. And it's in that city where we see the three conversions that I'll be teaching through today. Okay, so just keep the map up for me for a second, Rudolf. I just want to show you guys. They are in a very scary place. A very scary place. Look how far from home they are. There was no way to go Google Maps. Philippi, current weather, restaurants, main transport lines, ooh, main religion, main monuments, nothing of that. They are extremely far from home. And they are in a Roman colony. A place that doesn't look anything like the places where they come from. It's very, very different. And you've got one oldie and you've got three newbies on the team. And they have a strategy. And the strategy is we hit the synagogues first. And we'll see now that there's no synagogue in Philippi. And then we take it from there. So even though they have a strategy, they have zero security or guarantees. Zero. They don't have a card that can tap. Paul can't call F and B when they hit throw us and go, hey, can I just have some money in my credit card, please? We need to pay a ticket to Neapolis. They have what they have. And they have this call. And they are obedient to it. Obedient to the Holy Spirit. They've got the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is actually all they need. Now I would like to submit this to you, fam. Do you know that that is all that we need to? That's all we need. We need obedience to Jesus, and we need the power of His Holy Spirit. If we want to continue the mission that the church started in the book of Acts, then that's all we need. But I want to ask you a question, and that is, are you willing to go to scary places? Far from your comfort zone and maybe even your actual home, into a strange and scary culture with zero guarantees, with the guidance and the power of the Spirit for the sake of the mission. Are you willing? You might not know this of Marie and I, but when we got married in 2012, we literally prayed for nine months and asked God, where do you want to send us? Just say and we'll go. Yemen, Vladivostok. Denmark, Zambia, Maputo, Free State, like wherever God you want to take us, we'll go. And after nine months, God said, I want you in Pretoria. And we were like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. We're here already. We'll stay for a bit. And now I see why, obviously, in hindsight. But we had that spirit when we started. We ought to still have that spirit. We can't get all comfy now, almost married for 13 years, kids growing up, loving life, going on December holidays, that kind of vibe. 
That's not what will further the mission. What will further the mission is our willingness to say, well, God, wherever you want to send us, let's go. Here's what David Livingston said, well-known missionary to Africa. Lots of hospitals and schools and clinics and that kind of stuff um, named after him. Here's what he said. Without Christ, not one step. With him, anywhere. Hey, put that on your WhatsApp status and see how people react. So these gentlemen did. And when they did, something awesome happened. And what happened was that people got saved and a new church was planted. Isn't that awesome? Paul writes a letter to this new church that was planted a little bit later. And that letter is called the letter to the Philippians. The people in the church in Philippi. And the church did awesome, just by the way. Look at Philippians 1 verse 3 to 6. It says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We just read in Acts of the first day. I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul's most joyful letter from the worst place he was in, and his only letter where he doesn't correct the church. All of his other letters, he tells the churches, hey, fam, you're getting it wrong. To the Philippians, he just says, joy, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What an amazing church. So this is a super important moment in the story. And according to like historical data, this would also be the first city in Europe to receive the gospel. So what we're going to do in our remaining time is we're going to focus on the new converts in Philippi. As we focus on the new converts in Philippi, I want to remind you the gate is open. Someone was willing to go and share that the gate is open and someone was willing to go to scary places. And when someone was willing to go to scary places and share that the gate is open, new people came to faith. And we can identify with these characters. You know people who can also identify with some of the other characters. So let's study them. See how it identifies with us today. One question, who can be saved now that the gate is open? Three character sketches. Look at it with me. Rich, God-fearing, reasoning people can get saved. Poor, spiritually tormented people can get saved. And working, practical, and indifferent people can get saved. Now, how they got saved is equally fascinating. We will get to that. What race they are from actually also matters. We'll get to that. And we'll see, as we look at how they got saved and who they were, that the gospel truly is for everyone. The gate is truly open. Remember the call. The call was, come and help us. And us is a diverse variety of people. So, we'll map it out like this. Look at it with me. We'll go race. Economic class, spiritual condition, event. Now I just need to tip my hat at this point to the late Tim Keller. He was the one who mapped out Acts chapter 16 in this way. Um, I am a Bible nerd, you guys know it. So in 2020, we went on holiday to the sea and I was like, I am going to treat myself with something that will bless me this holiday. You guys know what it was. It was a sermon series from Tim Keller through the book of Acts. 30 sermons. I was like, yes. Every day I'm going to wash dishes and listen to Keller minister to me. I, I, in my house, that's fun. Well, not necessarily for the rest of the house, but for me, that is a lot of fun. So Keller was the first guy to map it out like this. Let, let's look at the first one. So rich, God-fearing, reasoning people. Read the text with me. On the Sabbath day, that's important. We went outside the city gate, also important, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. Stop. Previously, on the Sabbath day, we went to the synagogue. There's no synagogue in Philippi. You couldn't have a synagogue, according to Jewish custom, if there was not a critical minimum of 10 men. So you needed 10 Jewish men to constitute a synagogue. There is not even, there are not even, I don't know, 10 Jewish men in Philippi. Okay? So the strategy that they've always had doesn't work. So Sabbath, where are the boys at? Huh. 
where the lady's at. And then they just go. Do you guys see how agile they are in their strategy? Right? Sonke, women's devotional, down at the river. We weren't invited, but let's go. And let's go and meet them there. And look who they meet. Verse 14, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, that's important, a, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, and she was listening. Rudolf, can I just have the map up quickly, please? So we are now here in Philippi. There is Thyatira. Lydia deals in purple cloth, the most expensive material you can deal in in the ancient world. It was unbelievably scarce. Lydia was loaded. She had a lot of money. And she's branching out her business. So she went national and then international with her business. Dealing in purple cloth. She was rich, but something was stirring in her heart. Can you guys see that there's a highlight in verse 14 with the word listening? Do you guys see the highlight in the beginning of verse 14? She was God-fearing. So she was rich, but she didn't rely on her money for everything. She was searching, even though she was rich. And even though she was rich, she didn't believe that she knew everything about everything. And in those days, you could have done it, you know. Not a lot of people were as rich as Lydia. But she had a humble posture. She was open to learning. And she knew that her money will not save her. And then it says, the Lord opened her heart. And she responded to what Paul was saying. Nothing dramatic. Nothing spectacular. A sermon. Hey, ladies, sup. Hey, Paul, sup. What are you guys talking about? Oh, we're talking about the God of Israel. Oh, awesome. That's fascinating. And what are you guys talking about? Oh, we're talking about the promise of the Savior that he will send. Great. Can I tell you about him? Yes, his name is Jesus Christ. Awesome. I mean, what do I do next? Like, that's it. That's Lydia's conversion story. An Asian woman, rich, God-fearing, and the event through which she got sh sh not sh saved was public preaching. That's it. There you go. Rich people need the gospel as much as anyone. Rich people might not always believe it. And poorer people might not always believe that rich people need it. Rich people need it as much as anyone. Why? Because everyone needs to know that God loves you. And everyone needs to know that you can do nothing more to make God, ach, you can do nothing to make God love you more. And every single person needs to know that you can do nothing that will make God love you less. The struggle of a rich person in terms of identity and significance is exactly the same as the struggle of a poor person in terms of identity and significance. The gospel is for everyone. Do not make the mistake to think that we don't need the good news. Now look at what happens to Lydia. She opens up her heart, and then she opens up her home. Do you guys see it? She shares her faith with her household, verse 15, and then she shares her wealth. That's what happened when a rich person's heart gets pierced by the gospel. And Lydia's story is supposed to stir up in our hearts this generosity. Listen to me, if you have money, don't feel guilty about your money, just use it. Use it for kingdom purposes. Eat what you need to and sow the rest. That's exactly what happened to Lydia. And she was loaded. Lydia went, oh, heart, op heart opened up, you guys need to come and stay with me. Home opens up. And then Lydia is more excited about uh, uh, the fact that she's found Jesus then she is about the money she's made, so she goes back to her household and she says, I need to tell you about something, and that's Jesus. And then she starts sharing her wealth. Fam, listen, I know a lot of generous people who don't want people to know how generous they are, and I understand that. I think if I would have Lydia here today and I go, hey Lydia, do you realize that Luke wrote about you in the Bible? She'll probably say, oh. That was never the intention. I didn't want any glory. You know, I did it all for Jesus. And then I would say to Lydia, Lydia, even though I understand that, your story inspires us. So tell your story of generosity. If you are a generous person, then tell people about why you're generous and what happens when you are generous. So that generosity can be stirred up in our hearts. 
In South Africa, everyone is fending for their wickets, and everyone is scared that they might lose what they have. Everything you have comes from God, and it's His. And He'll give you what you need every single day. So why hang on to it with an anxiety as if this is the only things I'll ever have? Who made the sun come up this morning? Who brings us rain in season? Who put food in your stomach? But, but look, God, even though you can create and sustain everything on this globe, you really can't handle my finances. You see? My pension and my house and my fancy schmancy cars and my retirement one day, I just can't leave that with you. You're going to botch it, you know. Oh, you've taken care of creation since the word go. You've been fixing everything that humans have broken, but you can't handle my stuff. Look at what happens to Lydia. It opens up. It has a place for a church. And that church becomes a beautiful testimony to the Lord Jesus in a Roman colony. She didn't feel guilty about it. She just used it. Think rugby. Think ref next to them all going, use it now. Because the ref can see the ball. It's there to be played. So use it. Rich, God-fearing, reasoning people. Second one, poor, spiritually tormented people. They can also get saved, you know. Look at verse 16. Once, <clears throat> as we are on our way to a slave girl met us who had a spirit, interesting, by which she predicted the future, and she made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. Okay, let's just stop there. This is a native Greek girl. How do we know? Because in Greek, Luke writes that this woman had the spirit of Python. That's actually what the Greek text says. It's just translated out, because what on earth is the spirit of Python, according to us? Okay, so follow me here. She was actually called a Pythoness, like female Python. Now, Apollo was a Greek god. And if you wanted to know what was going to happen, if you wanted to know what your future entails, you would go to Apollo. And then through someone and something, Apollo would speak an oracle to you, a prediction of the future, proclamation, right? This is all part of Greek mythology. And as you approached Apollo, there would be a python guarding the temple. And the Greek people believed that Apollo is in the python because Apollo slayed the python and then he took the ability to give future-minded oracles from the python and then he made the python his slave to guard him, but his spirit is in the python. And the spirit of the python was given to some people then to predict the future to other people. So that's how it worked in the Greek mindset and in Greek mythology. So this little girl is owned by men. And these men use her. And what they use her for is to speak these future oracles to people who would like to hear from Apollo what lies in their future. And these oracles were weird stuff, ambiguous, confusing. Why? Because it's evil. Does this sound like a serpent we've heard of before? What did the serpent do? He cast it doubt. He didn't flat out say, everything that the Creator God told you is wrong. He just said, oh, that's interesting. Did he really? And then that opens up the possibility in the mind of Adam and Eve to sin. And to think, well, what if he did? So this girl is used by men and she needs to be freed. Now we see that she cries out and she says, These men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are servants of the Most High God. Is that true? It is true. So how weird is that? Someone who is bound by evil spirit speaks the truth. But, but which God is she, is she talking about? So she's, it sounds so much like the truth, but it's not really the truth. Because the most high God she's talking about is Zeus. Definitely not Apollo. And Paul knows that. So she keeps on saying these things. And because she says it, the woman who has the spirit of the python, people then look at Paul and Silas 
and Timothy and Luke, and they look at her and they go, oh, this is just another add-on to all the things that we already believe. And that's why it says Paul got annoyed. That word can also be translated as Paul was deeply grieved, you know. So Paul was, was grieved that this woman is bound, that she's being exploited, and that she's being used. But Paul was also grieved by the fact that it seemed like, because she keeps on saying this as she walks behind them, people will think that they are preaching something that has to do with Greek mythology, and it doesn't. So then Paul says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out right away. When the owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. And then the story continues, and they get in real trouble. How crazy is that? Doesn't that sound like Mark 5 to you? Jesus casts out the demon of demons from a guy in the region of the Gerasenes. Everyone has known that guy. Everyone was afraid for that guy. That guy's dressed and in his right mind, but people don't see the miracle. They see their loss of profit. So they go, oh. Your gospel is costing me something. Get out. And that's exactly what happens here. A dramatic, crazy, powerful exorcism. And people go, look, that was nice, but get out. Because you're ruining my profit. Isn't that crazy? So the story continues. And we see that as they are brought before the chief magistrates, let's go, let's go to verse 20, Rudolf. I'm not going to read all of it. I just want to show you quickly how, um, how the story unfolds. So then they get accused. And look at it. Seriously disturbing our city. That's not the truth. Promoting customs that are not legal for us. 100% not the truth. Well, unless you think of it as saying that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar is Lord. Yes, that is not something that a Roman citizen is supposed to do. But that's their charge sheet. They get attacked, they get severely flogged, and they end up in jail. And they end up in the inner prison, like solitary confinement. And they have their feet in the stocks. And then it says, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And prisoners were listening to him. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the jail were shaken. Okay, so here's how it was. Arms tied to the wall. Feet tied in stocks. Think of two wooden logs keeping my legs in one spot. Try and sit like this for a few hours. How do you go to the toilet? Right there. And then what happens? Then you sit in it. How do you eat? You can't. That's where they are. Because they freed someone who was bound by the evil one. And because the community revolted against them. And then Silas goes, Psst, Paul. Paul goes, yeah, dude. Silas goes, you're awake. He goes, yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, tough, man. I can't see through my one eye. My ribs are all smashed, struggling to breathe. How about you? Yeah, same. And then in the middle of the night, the only thing that's heard from the prison is, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. Just think about that moment. They start singing. They start praising. Sitting in your own excrement, not able to drink water or even wipe down your face. And you didn't do anything wrong. But something is driving these gentlemen. And that's what they do. And we complain when we have load shedding. We complain when we have water restrictions. We complain when there's a sinkhole on the N1. We complain when our DSTV stream buffers. We complain when the price of ribeye steak goes up. Are we serious? Are we serious about this? 
I'm not even bound now, but my arms can't take it anymore. I'm in pain as I'm sitting here. Can you imagine how those gents must have felt like? And why are they there? They're there because their gospel is costing the culture something. Now, I'm not a prophet, but I want to tell you that modern day persecution of the church is going to come through people who's going to tell us as the church, your gospel is costing me something, so you better leave. That's where it's going to come from. We believe in a gospel of justice and righteousness. Everyone have what they need, or everyone has what they need, and all people are in relationship with one another. That's going to cost people who want to hoard. It's going to cost people who love being polarized with others and who like to fight and make enemies. They are going to tell us as a church, get out of our way because you're costing me something. Think about what we do with our bodies. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we were created in God's image. But we live in a world where people want to do with their bodies whatever they want to. So that's why the church is receiving backlash. Because you are in my way. And your gospel is costing me something. We say that truth and hope is found in something inside of us. The world says you do you. That's where our persecution will come from. We've spoken about rich, God-fearing, reasoning people. We've spoken about poor, spiritually tormented people. Last one. Working, practical, and indifferent people. Paul called out in a loud voice, this is now after the prison doors have opened, don't harm yourself because we're all here. What would have happened if this was Jos Imampuru the second correctional facility? Do you guys think all the gents would have gone, just stay put gents, just hang in here a bit, we want to save the jailer's life, please, he's going to get in a lot of trouble. That's Paul. Why do you think everyone stayed? Because the guy who just worshipped told them to stay. And if someone can worship while we are in the stocks, I'm going to believe that this guy's got something. So Paul says, whoa, don't draw your sword, don't kill yourself. And here's what I love about the jailer. The jailer is a working guy. The jailer is a practical guy. The jailer is a guy that does something with his hands to put food on the table for his family. That's what the jailer does. He doesn't matter if he has to be a little bit aggressive. He doesn't matter if the Roman Empire imposes stricter rules. I need to feed my family. I don't care too much about the gods and religion. I just need to do my work. And that's why when he realized that the jail is open, he was like, I'm toast. I'm going to be killed anyway, so I might just as well kill myself and die an honorable death. And then when Paul says, no, we're all here, look what he does. Bring in the lights. I love it. <laughs> Very practical. Bring in lights. He rushed in, and when he saw them all there, something happened inside of him. He fell down, and he was trembling, and he says, what must I do to be saved? What happened in those minutes, in that time? I don't know. But this guy went from a strong, aggressive sermon, servant of the Roman Empire to someone very acutely aware of his own sin and brokenness and he needed salvation. How crazy is that? Okay, so we said the event of the slave girl was a dramatic exorcism. His event is a powerful miracle. So a Roman working class guy, practical and indifferent. Have you ever heard people say, look, I'm not a religious guy. That's the jailer, right there. And a powerful miracle convicts him. And he asks, what must I do to be saved? And here's what they say. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That is how easy it is to be saved. On our invite that we sent out to you for this weekend sermon, we asked the question, how do we get saved? Fam, we have to know the answer to that question. Because if someone asks you, how do I get saved? There's your answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. A small elaboration on that in Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. In this sense, what your mouth and your heart does is all connected to each other. That's what you should do to be saved. That's it. And you might sit here today wondering, what must I do to be saved? There you go. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. And I surrender my life to you. I repent. 
I want to receive your forgiveness. I confess my sins. I believe in you. That's how we get saved. And that's how simple it is. And as Christians, we should be open to those conversations at any point. And look at what happens. The same kind of change in him that we saw in Lydia. All of a sudden, his house is not his anymore. All of a sudden, his hard-earned money isn't his anymore. All of a sudden, money for medicine isn't his anymore. Fam, to wash their wounds and to give them a meal must have cost that guy a lot of money. And he wasn't Lydia, you know. Lydia had it. This guy was scraping by, imprisoning other people to put food on his table. And he's like, I'm going to sacrifice because something happened in here. And we see the same kind of change in him. So who can be saved now that the gate is open? Let's look at these three sec, uh, uh, points again. Rich, God-fearing, reasoning people, poor, spiritually tormented people, and working, practical, and indifferent people. Uh, Asian, a native Greek, and a Roman. Rich, poor, and working class. God-fearing, spiritually tormented, and practical, and indifferent. Public preaching, dramatic exorcism, and a powerful miracle. Look how God works. Isn't it unbelievable? And here's the crazy thing. This is our family. Our family is equally diverse, you know. And our family gets saved in equally diverse ways. We are vastly different, but we are unified with each other. Imagine going down to the river again, because there's still no synagogue, and the jailer sits down, and the slave girl sits down, and Lydia sits down. Just, just look at that picture. Hey, what's up? Yeah? Good in you? Yeah, good. Now I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I don't know how to talk to a Greek slave girl. I know nothing of her. Hey, what's up? How's it? Uh, lekker. Yeah, I don't know what to say to a rich woman with international business. I'm but a blue-collar jailer, you know. But there's one thing that brings us together, and that's Jesus. Just think about that. They, they got to know each other. <laughs> They knew nothing of each other. They were separated by class and wealth and race. And now all of a sudden, they go, Ah, oh, Paul, 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 okay, we know him. Fam, listen, I know this is very awkward. <laughs> I was actually hiding behind the tree to wait for Paul because I didn't know what to say to you. Sorry and sorry. But here's Paul. And let's learn. And then they grow together. Just think about that. And he teaches her something. And she gives her some money and she works for her and she helps him. And in that way, they build the church into a really successful, beautiful, joyful church that brought only joy to Paul's heart. We'll see that the gospel truly is for everyone. That's what I said in the beginning. Do you guys see it now? The gate is open. One response that I want to offer to you guys and then we'll get worshipping again. Leon, did you just give the worship team the nod? If not, thank you for giving the worship team the nod. Thank you, Chile. I see you. Just one. Just one. How did all of this happen? Rudolf, can I have the map up again, please? They were there. And someone from there shouted, Come and help us! Who's shouting at you? Who do you see? Who do you know? Who is God placing on your heart and showing you a vision for? It might be an individual. It might be a group of people. We planted this church because we felt like this community shouted, Come and help us! And we said yes. And we're going to keep on saying yes. As long as there's come and help us. Come and help us. <laughs> that didn't make sense in English. Until... The redemption of all things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the beauty of your gospel. Thank you that the gate is open and that it is for everyone. Thank you that we can be part of it. 
If we are not Christians, thank you that we can be part of it by believing in you. And thank you that we can be part of taking the good news to more and more people in places that call, come and help us. I'm reminded, Lord Jesus, of the lyrics of the song Hosanna that says, Break my heart for what breaks yours. Do a work in our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we would see the rich, God-fearing people who need you, that we would see the poor, spiritually tormented people that need you, that we would see the working class, everyday folk of this beautiful country who struggle to put food on the table, who also need you. Take us to them, Lord Jesus. Here we are. Send us. We pray that in your name. Amen.